Hello everyone, welcome to my channel and the disaster that is my studio. My name is Mark Kompanyets and I'm a professional artist and an art professor. It's a bit of a busy time for me at the moment with the spring semester underway, but I wanted to make this video because I was sent a pretty interesting pen that I wanted to share with all of you. One that has a unique feature that allows you to use it with black India ink that would immediately clog up other fountain pens. This pen is called the Indigraph, and it's made by a company of the same name out of Spain. I'm going to subject this pen to a series of tests to see if this company's claims are actually true. But before I do, I think we should talk briefly about a few different kinds of waterproof and water-resistant fountain pen inks available to the artist and explain why having a pen that uses India ink would be so useful. Let's get started. There are quite a few waterproof and water-resistant inks that are perfectly suitable for fountain pens. These two are my favorites, Noodler's Black and Platinum Carbon Ink. I've reviewed these inks in detail already, so if you haven't seen my videos on waterproof fountain pen inks, go and see it. But to summarize, both of these are fantastic inks that work in different ways. Noodler's Black contains a reactive dye that bonds with the cellulose fibers in the paper, making it waterproof. Noodler's calls this ink bulletproof because once dry, it's highly resistant to fading and being removed with all kinds of solvents. This is the ink that I most often use in my fountain pens when I need a black fountain pen ink. It flows very well, works in flex pens, dries quickly, and best of all, doesn't clog up my pens if they're left unused for extended periods of time. Though I don't trust it enough to place it in my vintage pens, I use it pretty much without fear in all of my modern pens. Platinum Carbon Ink is a pigmented ink composed of very fine carbon particles and possibly some kind of binding agent. I say possibly because there is no information about the exact composition of this ink. Carbon pigments alone have binding properties, so you don't actually need a binding agent to achieve some degree of water resistance. In fact, I've seen old recipes for making waterproof carbon ink that contain soot from the burning of oil and nothing else other than vinegar and water. Carbon ink is blacker and more opaque than Noodler's Black, but because it's pigmented, there's also a higher risk of clogging. So I will use this ink only in pens that are easy to disassemble and fully clean, and then try to flush out those pens regularly. Both inks are very black, safe to use in fountain pens, and waterproof, sort of. If you write with your pens and only require your ink to be fade proof and water resistant, look no further. If you only draw in pen and ink, also look no further. However, if you want to go over your ink lines with any kind of watercolor wash or ink wash, you might run into problems. The thing is, sacrifices had to be made in order for these two inks to be usable in fountain pens, and that sacrifice is in water resistance. While both inks do very well on regular drawing paper, when they can seep into the paper surface and properly bond with the paper fibers, many papers commonly used by artists are non-absorbent, such as watercolor paper, which is treated internally and on its surface with a thin layer of either gelatin or some kind of modified starch. Unfortunately for Noodler's Black and Platinum Carbon Ink, this prevents them from effectively bonding with the paper fibers, making them less waterproof than we'd like. The degree of water resistance will vary greatly depending on the paper, atmospheric conditions, the wetness of your pen, of course, but can be irritating if you're trying to go over your ink lines with very delicate colors. Here are a few tests that I did with Noodler's Black and Platinum Carbon Ink. Here's the first for Noodler's Black on relatively slick multimedia paper in my Talens Art Creations sketchbook. Now, five minutes is a bit too early to test any ink, of course, but you can see that the water resistance of 10 minutes and 30 minutes isn't really much better. The water resistance does continue to improve with peak resistance achieved at about 24 hours, but for sketching purposes, that's way too long a wait. The Platinum Carbon ink performed slightly better. In the five minute test, not that much, but after 10 and 30 minutes, we have far less residue. I repeated these tests on a number of different papers, and the result was frustratingly inconsistent and hard to predict. On watercolor paper, where I expected the deficiency in water resistance would show more clearly, performance was also all over the place. These two inks perform poorly on Arches cold press watercolor paper, but much better on the smoother paper made by Senelier. On this hot press paper made by Cartier-Magnani, these inks performed 
perfectly. I have to admit that this was very puzzling. I figured that two things would affect how well the inks performed, the absorbency of the paper and the surface texture. I figured that these inks would bind better to rougher surfaces and have a harder time on smoother surfaces. In fact, I was so confident that these two inks would perform poorly that I did tests on this Cartier Magnani expecting tons of residue, but there was absolutely none. This speaks to the complexity and variability in the manufacture of watercolor paper, which can be composed of different degrees of cotton fibers and wood cellulose, and be subjected to both internal and external sizing with a number of chemicals. The imperfect water resistance of dye-based and pigment-based fountain pen inks is why many artists still resort to using dip pens, since that allows them to use India ink. This type of ink usually contains a strong binding agent in the form of shellac, allowing it to dry quickly and bond itself to any paper regardless of absorbency or what kind of sizing it happens to have. Such ink is also more highly pigmented than fountain pen inks and is therefore more black and more opaque. The problem is, because of those stronger binding agents, it's usually completely unsuitable for fountain pens. For those of you lucky enough to have never tried it, things might work for a while, but if you stop, the pen will quickly clog and be rendered unusable. And cleaning out a pen full of dry India ink is no easy task, believe me, requiring long soaking and scrubbing. By the way, one thing that the people of Indiagraph beg me to clarify to my American audience is that India ink is called other things in other parts of the world. In the UK, it's called India which is what Indigraph uses in its promotional copy. So I hope this settles the controversy and my American fans will stop harassing the poor people at Indigraph for calling India Inc. Indian Inc. Here's a test on that pesky Talens multimedia paper on which the first two inks perform so poorly. I'm using the India Ink provided by Indigraph, which according to them is similar in performance to Pelican 17 India Ink. As you can see, it performed much better. On all other papers, the India ink also performed better, but the results were mixed. For example, on cheap absorbent paper, the results of all three inks were almost identical. On Strathmore Multimedia paper, it performed only slightly better. As for watercolor paper, it performed much better on Arches Cold Press watercolor paper, but was identical on Senegay watercolor paper, and on the Carta Magnani hot press paper, the results were completely identical. To conclude this rather lengthy discussion, India ink, to my mind, has two major advantages. The first is that with the first two inks, the performance was heavily dependent on the kind of paper being used, on some working perfectly, on others very poorly, whereas this variability in performance was much smaller with India ink, which, if given enough time to dry, would be consistently waterproof. The second advantage is drying time. On all my tests, India ink attained its full waterproof capacity faster. So what can you do if you want the convenience and portability of working with fountain pens, but yearn for the superior waterproof properties of India ink? Well, one solution has been around for over 140 years, the safety pen. This type of pen design features a retractable nib that gets completely submerged in the ink reservoir, which is then hermetically sealed by the cap. And this allows you to safely carry this pen anywhere, even on airplanes without the slightest fear of leaking. It also allows you to use India ink without fear. This small pen was made by Moore, a well-known manufacturer of such pens, and features a wonderfully flexible gold nib and is from the early 1900s. Unfortunately, most of these kinds of pens are well over 100 years old, so they're expensive, and because of the complexity of the attracting mechanism, difficult and costly to maintain and repair. This, however, is a modern equivalent made by Noodlers. This is the Boston Safety Pen, and it has a lot going for it, including the ability to use vintage gold nibs, and if you're interested in learning more, I have a full review of it on my channel. But it's not the easiest pen to use. You have to use an eyedropper to fill it, and you have to be careful to open it with the nib and facing up, because if you don't, all the ink will spill out all over your pants. Which leads me, finally, to present what is perhaps a more practical option for using India ink in a fountain pen, the Indigraph. Let's take a look at it. This is a sturdy, slender, all-aluminum pen with an industrial minimalist design similar to such pens as the Muji and the Hongdi in Black Forest. It's a little longer, measuring about 14 and a half centimeters or 5 and 7 eighths inches long. 
The only strange thing about it, at least on the outside, is that the end of the pen tapers and that the clip is on the back as opposed to being on the cap, which means that when you clip the pen in your pocket, you're carrying it upside down. The cap unscrews to reveal a number 5 steel Yovo nib and a housing unit. Uncapped, the pen loses quite a bit of length, becoming 13 centimeters or 5 and 1 8 inches. And then the barrel unscrews to reveal a standard international converter. But I'm sure all of you are thinking, we're not here to see international converters or number five steel Yovo nibs. What is the innovation? Well, Blackmagic allows this pen to use India ink. Well, it's right here in the cap. This little knob on top twists open, revealing a reservoir. At the bottom of this reservoir is a semi-permeable material, and then when you fill this reservoir with water, like so, it makes the conditions inside the cap very damp, preventing the nib from drying out. This is an ingenious little device, but how well does this work in actual practice? Let's do a drawing with this pen and see how it works, and while I draw, I'm going to talk about its pros and cons, and who I think this pen might be good for. First, and what you're all probably anxiously waiting to hear, is that the pen works very well, starting right up, even if left unused for several days. So long as you keep the reservoir filled with water, which you do have to remember to do every week or so, it should keep the pen clog free and ready to use. Besides the Indigraph India ink, I also tested this pen with a commonly found India ink brand that has even stronger waterproof properties, Super Black India ink made by Speedball, and I'm happy to report, no problems. However, not every India ink will work as well, apparently, so I would consult the ink recommendations on the Indigraph website for which ink you should use. Besides the innovative water reservoir, the pen also has a number of other advantages. The ergonomics and balance of the pen are great, with a long, all-metal body that feels substantial and sturdy without being clunky. The build quality is very good as well, with smooth threading and thought-through details, such as the clip at the end of the pen, which ensures that you store the pen nib side down, helping it stay wet. The pen uses a very nice number no. 5 steel nib made by the German nib manufacturer Yovo, which is one of my favorite nibs in terms of reliability, smoothness, and responsiveness. And the great thing is that the nib, feet, and housing have not been modified in any way, so they can be switched out with many other options. Indigraph sells number no. 5 Yovo nibs and housing units on their website, offering sizes from extra fine up to the 1.4mm stub, as well as Fude and Architect customizations. This pen can also be used with one of my favorite flex nibs, the number no. 5.5 Ultra Flex nib from Fountain Pen Revolution. There are also a few mostly minor flaws in this pen. The first is that the grip section of this pen is narrow and slick, which makes you tense your fingers when you hold it. The rest of the pen body has the same anodized finish, and since I like to move my fingers up and down the pen, the slickness here is also uncomfortable. I really wish more fountain pens had a knurled grip section, like we see in mechanical pencils, like the Rotrings. For artists that use their pens for hours at a time, like I do, that would be fantastic. Another gripe is that the cap threads and the step up to the barrel are a touch sharp. That can be fixed by making the cap slightly longer so your fingers aren't directly on it. Another complaint is that on most pens you have to remove the cap before unscrewing the barrel. In this case, the cap and barrel threads are right next to each other. This means that when you try to uncap the pen, you can accidentally unscrew the barrel. Another annoyance is the removable blue ring, which can be switched out with a few other colors. While this allows you to buy multiple pens and be able to identify them by color, this ring doesn't stay on when you open the barrel and can accidentally be put in the wrong way. Again, a slight irritation. My biggest complaint, and something the good people of Indigraph should seriously consider, is the use of the Yovo housing unit. While going with a number no. 5 steel Yovo nib is a very good decision, given its reliability and the ability to be switched out for many other options, the housing unit is not easy to disassemble, sometimes requiring the use of rubber grip and pliers. If it's that hard to remove the nib and feed from the housing unit when the ink is wet, imagine the difficulty if it was clogged with dry India ink. Having a friction fitted feed and nib like you see in Twisby pens makes the pen much easier to clean. Plus I can switch nibs in seconds without having to fully clean a housing unit after I've replaced it. 
So, who should buy this pen? Well, this is heavily dependent on a number of factors, such as your working methods, your style of work, the kinds of papers you prefer to use, and how much residue you're willing to tolerate. People that do quick sketches that don't want to wait around for the ink to dry might benefit from this pen. If you're very heavy with your inking and like filling large areas with black, you'll benefit from this pen. If you prefer working on papers that don't take Newther's black or carbon ink, this pen is definitely for you. And if you combine your inks with very delicate colors and don't want them polluted in any way, definitely get this pen. However, this pen is close to being $100, so I would carefully consider whether you really need it. If you mostly work on cheaper, more absorbent papers where the difference in performance is negligible, then I wouldn't spend the money. Here's a test that I did on regular drawing paper that I will occasionally throw watercolor on, and as you can see, there's basically no difference in performance between carbon black, noodler's black, and India ink. Also, if your color schemes tend to be on the darker side, or if you just don't care if your washes occasionally get muddy, then I wouldn't bother getting this pen. Here's my completed drawing. A big thanks to Indigraph for sending me this pen for review. It's been on my periphery ever since its inception, some three years ago, but for some reason I've never gotten around to trying it. Now that I have one, I can see its utility and will definitely be using it in future projects. And I hope you guys found this review useful, and if you did, please subscribe for more drawing instruction and art material and technique related content. Thanks for watching, and bye for now.